Yeah. And we are live. I see some folks joining. We'll give them a few few minutes to join. For those who are tuning in, uh, if you want to drop in the chat where you are tuning in from and your favorite Python library. <laughs> Love to see those responses. BG, do you have a favorite Python library? I have a few. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, of course, the Boto 3, the one that I'm going to talk about now, um, I, I like that. And um, uh, NumPy, um, you know, and the, um, some of the, you know, the uh, Psychic, the mm -hmm. libraries that help with the, I've not used the uh, data science libraries, but, you know, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but mostly the the NumPy and Bodo three. Love it, love it. We'll get to pick your brain a little bit on about the Bodo three library today. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Catherine tuning in from Santiago, Chile. Another Rachel from Denver. Welcome, welcome. And VG, you are in Richmond still. Richmond, Richmond. Virginia. Awesome, awesome. Hello from Guatemala. Uh, we have the beautiful soup for uh, A Adriana's favorite library. I feel like there are so many libraries in Python that uh, there are gonna be a lot in here that I have not heard of. <laughs> NumPy and pandas, awesome. Well, we will give folks about one more minute to join and then we'll go ahead and get started. Have you had a good day so far, VG? Yes, yep. So this has been a busy week, um, busier than normal. Uh, but you know, I'm not complaining. I'm happy to be able to work from home. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I like, I like the flexibility a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I will go ahead and kick us off. Welcome everyone. So many folks tuning in around the world. Happy to have you all on the call today. We are going to explore Python and DevOps with VG Nataranjan. And before we get to the meat of our content, uh, gonna give you a little bit of logistics um, and a little bit about the Women Who Code organization, and then I'll turn it over to VG. So first and foremost, uh, feel free to throw your questions either in the chat feature that's in Zoom or on the Q&A uh, feature, and we will hopefully have time at the end to interact with VG and get her input on those questions. Also, you can throw us as speakers in gallery view and um, also make the presentation a little bit larger. Um, and I think those are all the logistical questions or tips that I have for tonight. Uh, hello, my name is Bree Ogenwright. I'm a senior software engineer and 2020 Leadership Fellow for Women Who Code. And I co-lead our cloud and Python tracks. A little bit about Women Who Code for those who are new to the organization. And Should we start recording? Um, I think it is already recording, I do believe. Oh. <laughs> um, so for those who are new to Women Who Code, welcome for um, all of our familiar faces and friends, welcome back. Uh, a little bit about the organization. We aim to inspire women to excel in their technology careers. We see a world where women are representative across the technology landscape as technical, technical executives, founders, VCs, board members, and of course, software engineers. 
For all the events that we host, our target audience is uh, usually engineers with two or more years of experience looking for the support to develop and grow and uh, level up in their careers. For all of our amazing events that we hold, online and all of the digital spaces that we occupy our code of conduct is always in play and essentially you can uh, read it in its entirety at womenwhocode.com slash code of conduct but to sum it up uh, women who code is an inclusive community everyone who is excited and supportive of the women who code mission is invited to join our events and participate in this organization and uh, should you need to report any um, negative experience or harassment that you hopefully don't encounter uh, you can also fill out a report form at the same website uh, shown on this screen A quick little plug for this track, the Python uh, digital track. Um, we are in our social spaces on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at WWCode Python. Follow us there. Well, you can also join our community um, at womenwhocode.com slash Python. You can also reach myself and our other leadership fellow at the python at womenwhocode.com email address. We would love, love, love to hear your input, your ideas, if you're interested in being a speaker or volunteering in any sort of way, or just need some more information, feel free to reach us there. We also have a Women Who Code YouTube channel in which all of the events, including tonight's, is live on there. And then you can also join us in Slack. If you aren't a member yet, feel free to email us um, or Archna can potentially drop the link in the chat. The Slack channel is where we are constantly uh, asking each other questions, supporting each other, um, sharing new ideas. So I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to join us there. And finally, we have some amazing events coming up for this track from REST API integrations to building bots on Twitter. There's a machine learning study group, a beginner Python study group, a transition to tech and uh, computer science webinar coming up. So uh, all those social and online spaces that I shared earlier will help keep you in the know of more events that we add to our calendar. Um, but these are just some of the ones that are teed up and coming soon to a screen near you. So without further ado, I am super excited to introduce our guest speaker, VG Nataranjan, a technology leader and visionary with strong architecture and application delivery and DevOps experience. She's able to lead and transform really large organizations through technology learning curves, and she's a passionate servant leader who cares about people and is committed to growing female engineers via coaching, mentoring, and talent management. We are so thrilled to hear from you tonight, VG, um, and I will give you the floor. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Brianna, for the excellent introduction about Women Who Code, and also thank you for your contribution to the community overall. Um, I will jump straight into the uh, content that I have prepared for today. Um, and, you know, uh, hopefully you're able to uh, keep track of your questions as you come up with them um, and feel free to ask them uh, towards the um, end of the session. So with that, I am going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see my screen. So I'll go into presentation mode. So I will be doing some um, hands-on um, uh, demonstrations here. If you um, are not able to follow through um, real time, that's perfectly fine with the time available. I think it's somewhat unrealistic to expect that you will be able to um, follow along real time. 
Um, plus there are some initial configurations that I had to do on my computer, which is um, time consuming. Um, so as Brianna mentioned, the video is going to be on YouTube and the code that I will be sharing is on public GitHub. So you should be able to experiment on your own. Um, so just wanted to um, provide that uh, context. So today we're going to be um, looking at um, two types of, um, I would say, uh, tutorials, um, roughly. The um, first part is um, about building a continuous integration pipeline for Python code. Um, the second part, we will be talking a little bit about um, the Python Boto3 library. Um, so to start off with, I would like to um, talk a little bit about continuous integration. Um, and continuous integration, um, it has been around um, for a fair, fair bit of time. Um, it's not a completely new concept. Um, so I hope you um, have run into this at some point of time um, in your career. Um, so continuous integration, uh, as per Martin Fowler's definition, uh, Martin Fowler um, has written a number of books and scholarly articles on several topics, um, DevOps being one of those. Um, so I picked um, his definition of continuous integration. Uh, basically, it's a um, practice where uh, when you have multiple developers working on um, a shared um, repository or, 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 you know, when they are collaborating on building a feature for a business customer. Um, what continuous integration um, tells us to do is um, integrate the work that each person uh, does on their own um, on a uh, frequent basis, uh, daily, if uh, possible. Uh, it, it, with the aim of um, automating a lot of the validations that need to be performed when such an integration happens to make sure that no one introduced a bug um, as a result of their change and, you know, two developers working on two separate features didn't really step on each other's toes. So um, there aren't like um, changes that break a build. So those are all some things that um, continuous integration um, enables us to think about. Um, and the way the continuous integration um, guidelines are uh, adopted is via a continuous integration pipeline which is nothing but a set of automated steps um, executing in an orchestration platform like Jenkins. Um, so I've mentioned Jenkins here. There are other um, tools as well. You might have um, heard of CircleCI, um, which is another um, orchestration platform that can be used for this. Um, so some of the, I've listed some of the stages or steps that are typically included in a continuous integration pipeline. Um, automated build is one where when a developer um, completes their um, coding for a day or, you know, whatever increment they, they had planned, um, as they issue a pull request, um, there are the, their code is getting built automatically. And uh, so as the code is built, the um, code needs to be um, tested via some um, exhaustive unit test cases. Now unit tests um, are um, really standard practice these days. Um, there used to be um, religious arguments around unit tests and the value of them uh, way back when, when um, software delivery was uh, basically 
um, getting started. But the in the recent past, um, unit testing has been um, adopted as a best practice. Um, and there is time being devoted for building unit test cases as new code is written. So um, that's the holy grail for um, continuous integration. And if you are not um, familiar with how to write unit test cases, um, there are lots of um, tutorials available online around that. Um, so basically once a once a battery of tests are run on the pull request, um, the code is um, committed uh, to master. And then a, it, there's usually a manual step here where the um, code is merged. And of course, that manual step is usually um, pretty seamless because the automated build unit tests and any other um, quality tests that are run on the pull request um, are, are uh, going to give the information required um, for whoever is merging the code. They have the results from those uh, build and unit test execution available for them. So the decision of whether to merge the code or not is a pretty um, you know, uh, straightforward decision at that point. Um, the um, automated um, integration tests are again the um, tests that are written to uh, make sure that there's sufficient regression testing um, happening on the merged code base and ensuring that the uh, master branch is always staying um, intact and, and uh, bug free. Um, automated security tests, um, there are um, the um, DevOps, if you um, have noticed, um, DevOps is now DevSecOps um, with the increased uh, emphasis on security. Um, and it is also um, recommended as a best practice with continuous integration to automate some of your um, security testing. Um, as part of your pipeline. Um, and this, this includes, um, this could be your um, static testing. Um, there's also the possibility of dynamic testing, which can be part of your um, continuous um, delivery pipelines. Um, and the, the, um, that option is available as well. Um, the last step it usually in a CI pipeline is um, artifact creation. So a um, deployable artifact is um, either a jar file or a war file, or um, it could be a Python um, uh, a distribution file. And um, any of those which really get deployed to um, a server um, so those artifacts are, are basically the end um, product of your um, continuous integration pipeline, along with, of course, your um, test results and reports that go along with um, each of these stages. So that's the theory behind um, continuous integration. Um, let me make sure. Um, so what I would like to do is um, get into some um, hands-on uh, practice here. Um, and for that, I am going to show you some of the things that I have set up. Um, there is a repository called um, DataPy CI Pipeline. Um, and I will show you what's here. Um, so, um, so these this, do not get alarmed by the security vulnerabilities. There are some um, dependencies that are um, outdated. So I need to be updating my um, requirements.txt file, which I've not had the chance to do. So I um, will be getting to that soon. Um, so. This repository basically contains a, um, a Python program that basically um, implements a very simple 
um, REST API implementation. Um, my goal is to not go through um, this Python code. What's uh, going to be the um, focus for today um, is the CI pipeline that I have in what's called a um, Jenkins file. A uh, Jenkins file is nothing but a, um, a file that contains code that your Jenkins um, orchestration server understands. Um, so this basically um, will be um, able to execute on a um, Jenkins server. So I wanted to show you this. And also, um, as a next step, um, you would need to, in order to um, follow this on um, your own, you would have to install Jenkins in your local machine. Um, there are a lot of um, help available online as to um, how to do this. It's very um, simple uh, to install Jenkins. So I was, this is my um, local. Um, instance of um, Jenkins running on my um, laptop. So, and then once you have that, um, you open up Jenkins, log in, which I've done um, already. Um, and you would need to set up a uh, pipeline job. So, which I have done. So I have one pipeline job here and I can show you, um, so you usually um, go in to, let's say you wanted to set up something from uh, scratch, you would click on this new item um, to set up a new pipeline, um, which I have already done. Now, once you click on the new item, you basically are taken to um, this configure page. Um, and I did not do um, too many fancy things in here. All I have done is linked to my um, GitHub project here. Um, and I, um, another thing I have done is basically said, here's where my uh, pipeline um, uh, code is. And you can usually um, either provide all the steps from your Jenkins file um, here as part of your job configuration, or you can pull that information from your Jenkins file. Um, this is the recommended best practice because um, with DevSecOps, uh, the best practice is to maintain everything as code. Um, so by putting the um, continuous integration steps in a Jenkins file um, and um, referencing it here um, enables you to follow um, configuration as code uh, best practices. So um, what I have here is basically um, told Jenkins that my source code is um, my, uh, the SCM I'm using is Git um, repository URL you do have to provide um, credentials and you can, um, if you don't have one already, you can um, set up your credentials to log into um, GitHub using the add feature. And Jenkins does a really good job of um, encrypting the um, password so it's not available in clear text. You can then just use it in your um, subsequent jobs. So I've given the master from where to um, pull the Jenkins file. Um, so it's pretty um, straightforward at this point. Um, so I am going to um, go back. And once you have um, set up your um, job, you can hit build now. But before we get there, I wanted to show you um, what I have in my um, Jenkins file. So the very first step to um, doing any kind of um, packaging 
in any language, um, not just Python, is to give information about all the external dependencies. What libraries is our application dependent on? Um, and that's the um, first stage. So if you look at it, the syntax within a pipeline, you are basically separating out the logical steps, or, which is also called stages in your CI pipeline um, using this word um, called stage. Um, that's just a keyword. Um, and my first stage is installing the application dependencies. Um, and I'm using it by, um, you know, uh, issuing a shell command um, and using pip. And um, this does require pip to be installed on your Jenkins server. So as you um, set up your um, Jenkins machine, one of the steps in the install basically talks about um, downloading um, con libraries. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they should have an option for downloading PIP. If not, it's a very easy um, step to do that. So once you have your um, dependencies installed, uh, the next step I have is linting. Um, so PyLint is a, um, a popular library available for linting your code. Um, and if you are a um, ardent Python um, developer, you know how important indenting is um, for us. Um, so um, PyLint uh, not only uh, takes care of beautifying the code, it also takes care of some logical um, validation and flagging things that really, you know, uh, might be unnecessary in the code. So. Pylint um, helps us with um, linting. That's one of the, the steps I, um, if I'm recollecting it, that, that um, can very well be another stage in my list here, which um, I um, could have included. It's called um, static code analysis. And this usually involves your um, linting of your code um, and also catching some um, deprecated packages and methods, um, depending on uh, which static code analysis tool um, you're using. Um, the next step is basically um, a unit test um, step. Um, as you can see, I am um, executing my um, unit test my Python um, code that I had written that contains all the unit tests um, and the results from the execution of the unit test um, are getting um, sent to the Jenkins console um, through another um, library uh, called JUnit. So this is standard practice to basically have the um, results from your automated test runs just available on the console. So that's there um, to see the trend. Um, also to know if your unit tests uh, passed or failed. Um, build artifact. So this is the stage where um, you basically um, use uh, Python to um, develop your uh, distribution file. Um, so once you have your deployable artifact, um, you know, um, ready, you can basically um, use it and um, just put it on a, your um, development environment or a test environment for the subsequent battery of tests to be run on that. Um, so what I have done here, basically ensuring that the build was successful, um, and then using my um, setup.py code to um, create a um, wheel file. Um, so, and again, I'm using the archive artifacts uh, <clears throat> to basically um, archive the file what this does is it 
enables me to um, export the wheel file to my Jenkins workspace. A Jenkins workspace is nothing but a um, temporary folder that contains the um, all the uh, files and logs that are generated as a result of a um, Jenkins run. Um, so one thing, if you notice, my um, storing artifact stage is um, empty. So this is available as a um, homework if anybody is interested to experiment with um, some artifact repositories that are available out there. Um, you can either use um, PyPy or Artifactory um, or a combination of the two um, to really um, uh, practice um, actually exporting your artifact to an external artifact library, um, which is also a common pattern that you, um, that you will see um, for um, CICD pipelines. So um, having said that, I can go in here and hit build now. Um, and you can see this um, blue ball blinking here um, that basically shows us that um, Jenkins is running the pipeline. So the Blue ball is good news. The some of the reds that I had earlier were when I was actually trying to get my uh, code to work. Um, so this was successful. And as you can see, this gives a really nice view of um, the different stages that we had in our pipeline. So each one of these columns corresponds to a stage. Um, and as I was um, Mentioning before, we have the um, wheel file here that um, is under the um, artifacts. And this is basically the test results based on the test that were ex um, executed. So you can see that in the um, Jenkins console. So this portion of the screen is called the console. Um, so when I um, I can click on this. Oh, not, yeah. I need to download it. So I can um, download this and um, ex um, inspect the contents of the wheel file and you will um, actually see all the uh, Python packages that we had listed out inside the um, requirements.txt um, file. So that brings us to the end of the CI pipeline. Obviously, I do not have all the stages that I had listed here. Um, those are definitely things that we can um, do um, as, as homework. You know, there could be some other information available online. Um, to make the pipeline a bit more sophisticated um, with your know, feedback loop uh, being uh, sent back to GitHub. Um, so there is a, an option to integrate Jenkins with um, GitHub so you can see the um, results of a pipeline run within GitHub. Um, so there are lots of other um, uh, sophisticated uh, implementations that are possible um, in this space. Um, so, I, so we got to the build now portion and if you were to um, try this at your leisure, just clone the repo um, to your local and you can make um, changes as you would like to the either the Python code or the Jenkins file. So um you have that available so um now jumping to um continuous deployment um continuous deployment um is basically um a uh, practice where 
the code that is getting built on a regular basis. So um, after testing, it's actually getting deployed um, into production. So the ultimate goal is to be able to um, deploy code to production um, as many times as your um, or our um, business customer um, requires us to do. So with the rapidly um, changing requirements um, and the um, competition in um, product delivery these days, um, time to market is crucial um, and the continuous deployment um, is a way for us to uh, meet the um, time to market demands without compromising on quality. Um, so continuous deployment pipelines um, help us um, automate a battery of tests. And I've only listed um, performance tests here. Uh, there are several um, phases of testing that are usually run on any uh, piece of software uh, as part of the hardening process before it's released to production. All of those um, need to be um, automated and um, executed via a continuous deployment pipeline uh, before code is pushed to um, production. So um, some of the concepts that um, you might uh, run into in this space as you are thinking about deployment is um, containerization. Um, this is again another way to ensure that um, the um, deployable artifact really doesn't um, go too many changes as the um, code is pushed from one environment to another. Um, so containerization is a, a great way to ensure that um, what is tested is what um, gets pushed to production um, without too many uh, manual interventions required to um, setting up the environment or configuring your, um, your application. Um, infrastructure as code is another concept that you uh, might run into in this space, um, which is as you're deploying um, your application, especially in a um, cloud-based platform, um, you, you um, have the ability to um, codify the infrastructure um, as well, um, where you, as part of your um, CI CD pipeline execution, infrastructure can be provisioned um, via the pipeline um, as well. Um, plus, it helps us to not have long running um, environments, especially if it's a non production environment. Um, if you get charged um, uh, on a, a paper use um, purpose, uh, pay, uh, on a, a paper use basis, um, infrastructure as code is um, really necessary to cut down costs um, where you can provision infrastructure on demand. Um, so the other concept that you would run into is uh, monitoring as code. Um, again, this is another um, best practice that is a um, rec um, recommended best practice from um, the uh, DevOps um, standards where you really um, bake in monitoring as part of your um, pipeline, uh, ensuring that uh, monitoring is being included in the um, feature delivery. Um, and not after the fact. Um, so these are some concepts that um, you might be um, running into as you're uh, looking at um, continuous deployment. So one thing that I really wanted to um, talk about here is um, Python's Boto3 library. Um, so Boto3 has a um, lot of features, you can actually um, use Boto3 to programmatically interact with your, with the um, AWS environment. Um, so 
Um, you might um, have a question if you have worked in the AWS space or even, you know, have, um, if you're uh, going to be um, learning about AWS, one thing that you would run into is AWS has its own command line interface for interacting with um, the uh, platform. You also have cloud formation templates um, that are available um, from AWS as a way to codify the infrastructure. Um, so it's a very natural question to ask, um, what's the gap that Boto3 is filling in here? Um, Boto3, in my opinion, really helps us um, programmatically um, interact with your um, environment, especially if you want to run some um, checks and balances uh, um, against the environment. So um, cloud formation templates are definitely the um, way to go for uh, maintaining your infrastructure as code. Now, if you really wanted to um, query your platform, if you wanted to um, save information on your S3 bucket, if you really wanted to um, get a list of um, servers that are that have been um, stood up, um, if you really wanted to loop through your um, resources and take some action on them, so. Uh, there, Boto3 um, and Python really give us a great way to, um, to do that type of programmatic um, manipulation of the um, uh, AWS platform. Um, again, um, so one way to um, test out um, and get your um, hands dirty is um, create a, a a free tier account on AWS. It's very um, straightforward. Um, install Boto3 on your um, local. Um, and there are lots of um, help available online um, to perform these steps. Um, once you have um, uh, the installs complete, you can uh, use the AWS configure command um, to basically um, set up your um, credentials to be able to talk to your AWS environment from your local machine. Um, so all of this is really um, interesting to explore if you have not uh, been able to get into this yet. Um, it's very easy, um, straightforward, um, doesn't take too long to um, do this um, setup. So um, one thing I would like to show now is um, on my local, let me expand on this. So as you can see, I um, have done some of these um, steps already in my local um, and the um, Python, let me clear so I can start from scratch. Um, so this is my local environment. And as you can see, I have my, um, I have some files here. Um, I'm just going to create another file. So I, um, I already had a uh, program here to create an S3 bucket. Um, if you're not familiar with S3, um, it's just a, um, I'm not trying to oversimplify S3, it's just a, um, a share drive, um, if you will, on um, AWS. So you can actually stick, um, objects in them or files in them um, and really share that with uh, with your application or with each other. There's um, a lot of things that S3 can do. Um, 
I wanted to show my um, AWS um, account. And as you can three, as you can see, my um, I have a EC2 instance, and I also have um, several S3 buckets. Um, I have um, several S3 buckets, but um, this is the one that we will be looking at. Um, you see file one, file two already on here. Um, so what I'm actually going to do is run this program. So um, let me, I will get back to what you see here shortly. I just wanted to show that we see um, file3.txt that's been um, uploaded um, to S3. And let me see if I have my, I haven't pushed that yet, um, which I will do that shortly. Um, but I can absolutely show the code that I have written. It's pretty straightforward. Um, in my um, hello boto.py, I'm importing the boto3 library. Um, and it basically, um, lets you um, talk to EC2s, lets you talk to S3. Um, as you can see, um, I am basically, uh, this is the piece of code where I'm going through my EC2 instances. Um, obviously, AWS CLI will let you do this, uh, but in my uh, programmatic way of looping through them, it actually lets me do a lot more with the EC2 um, instances um, than just print the instance ID. I could be adding um, other things here um, as well. Um, so that's what you see um, here on the, um, in my um, command window here. Um, and the part where I am adding the um, S3 bucket name is basically um, picking up the um, command line arguments for my bucket name and object name um, and doing a um, put operation on the S3 bucket, which results in the file getting stored. So that's a very um, simple um, example of um, how to use um, Boto3. Um, and um, as you can see, I did not get into setting up a continuous deployment pipeline using Boto3. Um, that is something that um, I would welcome you to um, try on your own by adding on to the um, Jenkins file. Um, you're more than welcome to reach out to me uh, on GitHub. Um, if you get to the um, repository that have um, on uh, public GitHub, and we can discuss as to how what are some things that um, can be done in that space. So, um, one um, simple thing that can be done is um, really um, see if the um, wheel file that we created as a result of running the CI pipeline, if that wheel file can be um, downloaded from the Jenkins workspace and uploaded to an S3 bucket um, using the Boto3 um, library. So that's just a, a um, hint 
uh, that I wanted to share. That's one thing that you could try and do to get um, a feel for how to um, combine continuous integration um, and continuous deployment um, using a Jenkins pipeline. So I know I said a lot there. I wanted to stop and really um, take the opportunity to answer questions. Awesome. Well, we have quite a few questions that came in. I can feed them to you. First one, do you know how much Jenkins costs? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so a, a um, disclaimer, I'm not going to claim that I will have the answers to all the questions. So if I'm not able to answer, um, I will either get back to you uh, via meetup um, or, you know, um, if we'll have to Google to, to find out. Just, just wanted to um, provide that public service announcement. Um, Jenkins, there is a, an open source um, version of Jenkins available, so it's free. Um, and that's what I, I really like about Jenkins is um, the free version goes a, a long way. And uh, you can pretty much do everything you want with the open source um, version of Jenkins. Um, I think we have another one. I am new to the CI pipeline and your presentation is very clear. Could you provide a copy of the PowerPoint slides? <laughs> yep, absolutely. Um, so will we share that um, via Meetup, um, Brianna? Is that a good yes. way? We can share it in Slack um, and in the meetup, and I will include a link on the YouTube description as well. Awesome. Um, Someone asked, automated security tests, how to? <laughs> yes, so uh, great question. So um, there, there are, um, two types of security tests that um, can be executed. Um, one that uh, typically belongs in a CI pipeline is called static security. Um, and there are um, tools available in the market. I'm not sure if you've heard of um, a tool called Fortify, F-O-R-T-I-F-Y. Um, that's a popular tool for executing static security tests. Um, and Fortify has an API interface. Um, you can basically interact with the, a, an installation of the tool. Um, and you submit your source code and Fortify scans your code and basically tells you if there are any um, cross-site scripting, SQL injection type of vulnerabilities in the code. So um, that's a popular tool. There's also something called white source um, that's available. Uh, there could be others. Uh, since the last time I checked, this has been a rapidly evolving um, domain. Um, and the dynamic security testing is one where you um, try penetration testing um, and you try to do like man in the middle type of attacks. Um, and those tools actually, I ha don't even know if there are any that are um, mature enough um, at this point to use. I've heard of some things called Arachne. Um, I've never tried it, um, but you know, there, there's some discovery that needs to um, happen there. Awesome. Um, another attendee asked, what's code ship? Oh, I've not run into code ship. Is that another, I'm, I'm sure there's a, a platform of service offerings in the DevOps world. Um, sounds like one of those. Uh, so I, I would have to claim ignorance on code ship. There's definitely a ton popping up nowadays, right? Every company I look at there now offering um, platform as a service yeah. options. All righty. Um, 
Not sure about this question. Someone said Heroku has pipeline. What is the pipeline there? Oh, yeah, that's another um, thing that I'm not all that familiar with. Um, sorry. And there's GitLab. I know, I don't know if people have heard of GitLab. GitLab is another fantastic, um, you know, um, out of the box um, CI CD. There's a lot of support for CI CD there. And I think you had mentioned some unit test tutorials. Is, is there a location that you can direct our viewers? Um, yes, um, I have seen some within tutorials point. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I can look up some more um, and we can post it on Meetup. There are um, actually, we would need to look at um, unit testing. Um, examples, unit testing frameworks that are available on a per language basis. Um, Java has its own um, and there are some um, libraries available that um, really execute your unit tests and, um, you know, used for code coverage. Um, there are some tools available um, like uh, Cobertura and there are some other comparable things in the um, JavaScript um, land um, as well. So you'll have to look at unit testing um, tutorials per language um, to read up on those. Fabulous. And we'll have one more question. Um, is there another use case outside of the one in your presentation that you would recommend trying that you see in the industry all the time? I'm assuming this is part, uh, in reference to that second portion that we just did. Oh, okay. Yes, absolutely. So the continuous deployment is a um, really vast um, topic. It would be... Um, great to look at um, how to um, deploy not just on AWS, you know, you can also do continuous deployment on um, on-prem uh, servers. Um, that's quite possible too. Um, so you could look at um, how would you deploy to, for example, a um, WebLogic server um, that's been set up on an on-prem server. So you could um, look up, look that up. Um, there are, you can also look at how to deploy to um, Azure. Um, I've not, I don't have any experience in that space, but that's an example. Um, so we looked at um, Boto3 um, in this case you don't even have to use Boto3. You can um, do uh, completely all the things that I talked about um, just using um, Terraform um, or CloudFormation templates um, really you know, supplemented with some shell scripting. So you could look at you know, building um, continuous deployment pipelines using um, a combination of Terraform or CloudFormation template with shell script acting as uh, a wrapper there instead of your um, Python using Boto. So there are different flavors available. Um, I think there is a, that's a blessing and a curse at the same time um, because there are so many ways you can, um, so many options available. So at one point it just becomes a matter of uh, preference um, as to, you know, what you're comfortable with. That is a phenomenal point and a great tip. Uh, there's a whole world of options out there, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, VG, I thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your expertise with us tonight. That was a phenomenal presentation. I love the tidbits uh, about our own homework and ways in which we can explore not only what and walk through what you did, but further our learnings by exploring a little bit on our own. So that is great. To all those who are wondering, yes, this will be available on our YouTube channel. And just as a quick reminder, 
ways to stay connected with the Python track for women who code. We hope to see you at future events and thank you all for joining tonight. Thanks, VG. Thank you. Thank you.